if I told you that there's a technology that can completely prevent the chance of any incidents happening around dam walls and other major infrastructure like this, that can also eliminate any chance of fatalities from happening ever again when needing to walk out across mine walls to install objects, and that can also protect the environment and take people out of harm's way in the fuel reduction burning space. And what if I told you that we're doing all of that with one of these, a drone? Well, not this one, a little bit more like that one. And we're doing all of this from a small country town, Sheffield, in Tasmania. So I come from a family of problem solvers and innovators. On my father's side, we have over 100 years of cattlemen running, running cattle through the highlands of Tasmania. And that's my pop, Roy, in front of a hut that he helped build. On my mother's side, my great-grandfather was a local inventor who invented the self-service petrol bowser. He, got sick of, he was a mechanic that got sick of people coming to his workshop and asking him to go out and fill up their car. So he made it so you could put a penny in the bowser and you'd get a penny worth of fuel. And also, growing up on dairy farms across Tasmania, I watched as my family utilised the scarce resources that they had around them to fix things when they were broken and not just buy something in when it, something in new. So I understand that people have different relationships with drones. Not long after I started out in the industry, I was filming an event where I was flying around behind the stage, filming the crowd, when this elderly gentleman came up to me and he said in no uncertain terms, land that thing now! I said, OK, mate, no worries. I'll land it and I'll come over and we can have a chat. So I landed and went and asked him what his concerns were. He said that, look, mate, I'm a farmer and this technology has developed so fast, I just I don't understand it. And if I'm honest, it scares me. And I get it. When the technology is being used for military applications, for filming multi-million dollar real estate homes, or people are just out having a bit of fun with them, creating that annoying buzzing sound you can hear when you're trying to relax at the beach. So I understand that people are suspicious of them. <clears throat> but I want to talk to you today about how we use drones. Drones to us are something of innovation in service of solving truly major problems for humans. So at around 26 years old, I'd been working in the mines for about five years, and I'd saved up enough money to go on a trip around the world. I had a chance encounter on a yacht in the Mediterranean where I met another solo traveller. I remember going up onto the deck of the yacht and hearing that annoying buzzing sound and looking across and seeing Matt holding a controller in his hand. I went over and I said, what are you, what's that and what are you doing? He said, that's a drone. I'm shooting a promotional video and this is how I make money. Being a nerd and having never seen anyone fly a drone before, I was super intrigued. Matt taught me of an innovation that I could bring back to my life in Australia. And when I got back to my job working in the mines, I remember sitting, which I wasn't really enjoying, I remember sitting down and one of my at Smoko and one of my colleagues slid his phone across the table and he said, check this out. I picked up his phone and it was an ad to get a commercial drone pilot's license. He said, wouldn't it be great to get out of this place? I said, bloody oath it would be. <laughs> so, not long later, I quit my job, I sold everything, I moved back from Perth to Tasmania, where I started my company, Taz Drone Solutions, working out of the a, a granny flat back on our family farm. And I ended up getting my license with the company that was in that ad, which led me to the innovations that I'm going to share with you now. So for the first year, I did the classic um, shooting productions, taking photos, doing whatever I could, but I quickly found my niche, my own niches, bringing drone training to Tasmania, doing construction survey packages, generating 3D models, and just pulling drones apart and tinkering with them, just getting my feet as a general drone guy. So as much as I love the technology, and it's at the heart and the core of everything that I do, a lot of the big projects that we're working on today have come from relationships, old and new, like one I had with a mate from school who introduced me to his dad, Tony, who was the manager of the local hydroelectric scheme. 
A few weeks later, after meeting him, I was standing at the base of a giant damn wall with my brother Luke and Tony. And back then, the imposter syndrome was absolutely brutal. Coming from a completely different industry, working as a driller and a heavy machinery operator in the mines, everything scared me from sending a text message to calling and especially going to site. So my brother took the day off work to come and help me. I never forget standing at the base of the wall and Tony saying, you see those weeds up there? Well, you have to get abseilers in to abseil down the wall and spray them one by one because if we don't, the roots will grow through the wall and crack the infrastructure, which could break the dam and lead to a catastrophic failure, which could be very bad for people downstream. And I remember looking up at those weeds thinking, what? You're telling me somebody's got to abseil all the way down to hit that patch of weeds right there? That's crazy. He said, do you think this is something you'd be able to help with? I thought about it for a second and said, yes, having absolutely no idea how to do it. <laughs> Thus started my innovation journey. Having never built a drone before in my life, I enlisted the help of a good mate, Brady, who's an engineer. Over the course of a year, we got all the cheapest parts and components we could in to build a dinner-sized table drone with the vision of having a five-litre tank underneath it with a boom that comes straight out the front with a nozzle on it and a camera so you could fly along the wall and you could see the weeds and spray them one by one. Sounded pretty easy, right? <laughs> However easy that sounded on paper, it was most certainly not the case. Brady and I used to meet up two or three times a week at his hangar and after a year, it just felt like an endless battle of defeat. What could go wrong went wrong. I'd go down there, keen for a good night, and would plug a battery in and blow up all the electronics. <laughs> or we'd do something stupid, like plug in the wrong cables to the motors so they'd spin anti-clockwise rather than clockwise. So you'd go out to do a test flight, and it would result in the classic flip over and break everything manoeuvre. So we'd fix that problem, and that'd lead into another problem. And then we'd fix that, and the same thing would happen. Some progress. I just got so used to the fact that every time we were going to work on this, something was going to go wrong. So I just, so I just got used to that, and I, just, I knew that it was go going to be hard, and that was just that. So we managed to get our newly named, aptly named Franken drone in the air for long enough for me to have the confidence to book a trial in with Tony. And one week out from that trial, everything was going really good and we're out on the farm doing our test flights. When all of a sudden, the drone flew up to about 10 metres in the air and just fell out of the sky and come crashing down in front of us, breaking to a million pieces with our hopes and dreams. We had made big promises and we had invested everything we had with no external funding on this project. So failure was completely out of the option. So we hit the drawing board, and within a week, we managed to design Prototype 2, Franken Drone 2.0. What had taken us one year prior had only taken us one week. This was an outstanding lesson early on on how compounding knowledge can accelerate future developments, even if it's excruciating. So we got Franken Drone 2.0 out to the trial, and I managed to keep my shaky hands and buckets of sweat at bay long enough to fly the drone along the wall and squirt a couple of weeds and come back and land. Tony came over to me and he said, great work, mate, you've done it. And not long after, we got a couple more damn walls to do, and now in, t now in time, that has grown out to us doing all of their dangerous infrastructure across the state. It's grown out into doing qu cliffs, quarries, mine sites, estuaries, all once extremely dangerous areas to get people into. It gave me the confidence to say yes when another project arose from a problem and caused the ripple effects that led out into few other projects that I'm going to talk to you about now. So in 2019, I was helping a mining company develop an internal drone division. And I was out on site one day with one of the geotechnical engineers when he came up to me and started telling me about the challenges that he was facing. He said that due to a tragic incident where a worker had fallen, to, had fallen to his death, they were no longer able to walk out along their walls to install survey prisms. He said that 
Normally, they would walk out along the wall with metal posts and a pole driver, and at every 50 metres, they would pole driver them into the ground, screw a prism onto them, and that would be picked up by a device on the opposite wall. He said that without prisms on their walls, they can't detect the movement, and if the wall slips, it could be catastrophic for anyone at the bottom of the wall. He said, we've been looking at ways of getting these prisms out. Do you think you'd be able to help? I had no idea what a prism was, <laughs> but I said, yes, I'll figure it out. So, over the course of a few years, we ended up designing and building a custom drone and a payload that we could screw a prism onto, that we could fly out and land and install them one by one along the wall, completely removing any people from needing to go on the walls. Yeah, good one. Let's go. After many, many iterations on the drone and the payload, we ended up landing on a, on a metal tripod, a heavy structure that we could land on all sorts of different ground terrains, clay and rock. We also made another a, a magnet that we could fly out and click onto the tripods and bring them back for reutilization and recycling throughout the, the workplace. We made another Franken drone with a high pressure gurney underneath it so we could fly out and clean the dust off the lens of the prisms. So we ended up getting, getting in front of the, the senior geotechnical engineer and trialing all of these technologies and he was so impressed that he got the word out to the world. And now, over the last two years, we've installed over a 1,000 of these across the country. And now we're getting inquiries from Brazil, from the United States, from Egypt, and even South Africa. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we had no idea that putting a prism onto a wall was going to have ripple effects that would go global. We were just focused on solving the, the problem that was in front of us. It wasn't a Silicon Valley, million dollar funded venture. It was, just, it was just us funding it ourselves, working on Nan's farm, sometimes out of a garage, test flying and using the scarce resources that we had around us to do what we could do. And now this has grown out to give us the facility. We've been able to expand our facilities and our team to tackle other hard projects like this one. So in 2021, uh, after watching my brother and father play, play a game of pro lacrosse just outside of Sheffield, I was introduced to Linda, a local fuel reduction burning manager. Linda explained to me some challenges that she was facing when trying to contain fuels across the state to prevent major wildfires and to protect our infrastructure. She said that people are walking out in, onto cliffs and into dangerous areas and lighting up fires in our forests and grasslands. And where they can't get people out to, they're sending in helicopters. So she asked again, uh, no, she said that she would love somebody that could fly a drone out, that could light fires with a drone, could use a thermal camera that could locate hotspots within the fire, and could also fly a drone around to, for situational awareness when a burn is happening. And she asked if it was something that I would be able to help with. And at this point, you've probably figured out what I said. <laughs> yes, I'll figure it out. So we had enough information to start procuring and designing the technology that we needed to start helping in the fuel reduction burning space. We identified a technology that we could start working on, a heavy metal tank that we could sling under a giant drone with highly flammable liquid in it that would pump out the bottom and go through an arc and burst into flames to light up a fire line. We'd identified the technology, and that was a big challenge, but another challenge now was also building out a team to be able to do this. And as a leader, my goal was to create an environment where it was okay for everyone to make mistakes and to learn from those mistakes and implement solutions rapidly. So once again, what sounded very easy on paper ended up being extremely difficult. We had to design and build our own metal tank, our own electronics, our own pump to pump the viscous liquid, our own ignition source, and stop that flame from going all the way back up through the line and blowing up the tank in front of us. And having made many mistakes along in the past, 
I knew that this was just a part of the process. And I also knew that we needed to create a culture while we were going through this of resilience and risk-taking and where it was okay to keep failing rapidly. So only just last week, we managed, after three years, we managed to get all of this technology out and trial it up in the Highlands with Linda. And at the end of the day, Linda came over and said, gave me a big hug and, like Tony, said, thank you so much, we've finally done it. And this is what it looked like. So I hope these stories have highlighted the good that the, technology, that, can, that the technology can do. The drones aren't just some annoying buzzing sound that you, can hit, what you're, hit, that you hear at the beach, and it's not just linked to military applications. That you can utilise the scarce resources around you and you can create something that could have a positive impact. To, to create an environment where it's OK to make mistakes, to say yes, and just figure it out along the way, and to remember to, to remember to nurture the relationships. So yes, it's about the technology, but more than that, it's about using what you have for good and to nurture the relationships along the way. Thank you. Yeah.